episode of I'm in a Car, and I have the honor of uh, taking Jim Essel for a drive. Uh, I know we, you, you've been known in the UA for, I want to call them pedo meetings. <laughs> yeah. Walking yeah. meetings. Yes, exactly. So, so that, that's what I am known for is walking meetings. So we'll do it different when it's in a car. It's okay. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, I, really I, I should have brought some arm hand weights or something. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get some foot pumps or something like exactly. that. Exactly. All right, let's do this. Uh, so, I mean, not everybody watching this might know Jim Estel. Um, I feel like most people that watch this will probably know who you are, but for the sake of the audience, would you mind just giving us a quick little introduction in terms of, like, where you're from and how you ended up uh, running Danby and, and Shipper B and all that great stuff? Sure. Uh, I don't know how far back you want to go. I mean, I, I'm an engineer. My first business, I needed a computer to design circuit boards. I got a better deal. I bought two of them, so I bought two and sold one, and then someone else wanted one, so I bought another two, and then I bought some printers, and someone needed some software, and pretty soon I'm buying and selling computer hardware and software peripherals, and I built that business to a couple billion in sales. I retired, and I uh, lived in New York doing angel and venture capital for yeah. a while, and then my dad got sick, so I moved back to Guelph. And are you from Guelph originally? Uh, from Woodstock. Woodstock. Close, close, close so the area. Yeah. And um, then uh, I happened to sit on the board of Danby Appliances. The CEO of Danby resigned, and I said, well, I can go in and run it for a while. And I realized that I prefer operating a business to just being a uh, board member, advisor, investor. And uh, so the, then the, the, the family that owned uh, Danby Appliances said they want me to sell it. And I said, how much for? And they, they told me, and I said, great, I'll take it. So I ended up buying so that's, sure, I'll that's take it. it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Well, that was that was probably the best Coles Notes version of any like background introduction that, that, we've had. That's it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, so, well, I mean, just on that note, um, you, you really. So I grew it to two billion, a couple, couple billion in sales. Yeah. Um, you know, I think a lot of people don't necessarily see that as like a possibility in their own mind. Is there any way you can like help connect the dots? Like how the heck do you go from buying two computers in the trunk of your car to a couple billion in revenue? So what I, what I did when I'm doing a million in sales is I talked to people doing two and three and four million in sales. And then, I, then when I got to five million, I studied those that were doing 10 and 20. And then when I got to 20, you do 50 and then you do 100 and then you do 200 and then you do 500. And eventually you say a billion so you just keep studying people at a higher level. So it's kind of happened slowly over time. I actually believe I would not have been able to do the $2 billion company had I not done the trunk of my car startup because it gave me background and experience and all this stuff that I needed. From the ground up? From the ground up. Literally, exactly. yeah. Exactly. And when you were looking ahead at other businesses that were doing larger volumes, were they businesses inside your industry or did it matter? It didn't, it didn't really matter. Most of it's uh, most of it was not exactly you know bang on and competitive. And so there's things that are common in all businesses. The other thing I do is I filter suggestion. So one person might say, oh, here's, they only do walking needs and houses. They do driving. They you just filter and say, oh, yeah, I like that idea. I'll take that one and combine it with this one and make it mine. Yeah, okay. And so that's how I would uh, I take little bits and pieces from everybody. And so when you're looking at the businesses that were ahead or yes. doing large volumes, um, what aspects of the business would you focus in on? So, so I would usually end up focusing on something that was occurring, causing me my current issue. So my current issue was I was having problems hiring people. Then I talked to someone else. Oh, well, how do you hire people? How do you retain people? Whatever. And then, of course, you know the way it is in business. You sort of solve one problem, and then you have another problem. Oh, we've got tariffs now. Oh, what, how, what are you doing around that? So it tends to change, but to some extent, it also depends who you're talking to what their expertise is. Right. So um, I talked to you, oh, well, let's talk some more marketing because you're kind of like a marketing guy, right? Sure, As sure. opposed to saying, oh, great, we're going to talk uh, manufacturing process. I wouldn't think that you're the, the main guy, my go-to guy for manufacturing process. Nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair statement. Yeah. So then, uh, and then so from a tactical perspective, just for anybody, like, I mean, that idea seems really simple in that, hey, find someone that's, a, you know, doing work. They are where you want to be. Right. And then talk to them. Was there any, was it as simple as just reaching out and saying, hey, I'd love to learn about what you're doing? More or less, yes. You, you will be amazed at the number of people who return your call and spend time with you. And it's a little like sales. What's the worst case? I, I, one of my expressions is, what the heck go for it anyways? Awesome. So I can ask someone, what's the worst case? They say no. What's the worst case? They don't reply to my email. 
well, I'm no further behind. You know, no. It cost me my, my email cost. Well, that doesn't cost anything really, right? <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Um, and, and what I learned about scaling, usually it had to do with me. So what, what growth did I have? How did I have to change to run when I'm doing a $10 million company to, to be a $20 million company? How, what do I have to change to go from a hundred million to a billion? And the biggest thing I learned which is tough for me because I'm a little bit of a micromanager or a perfectionist, is what can I give up? And I need to give up things. And it's tough for people to give things up, but that's the only way to scale. If, if you keep doing what you do, you will not scale. You, if I, if I'll I bottleneck you, everybody. You'll bottleneck everybody. If I tell you you're going to triple your sales and you say, I'm going to keep doing everything I do, no, that means you're going to have to give up this relationship with this guy you like having a relationship with in business and but you're not scalable right so from that idea um so i mean i thought i was doing a good job of giving stuff up and then i realized after looking at it harder i'm not i'm like there's more stuff i need to give up and um i'm, I'm, I'm definitely having a hard time with it because i, I want to see things happen a very specific way and if they don't, right. then I have to just deal with that. But I'm all for it because I get the idea. Um, when you decide what to give up, um, what kind of lens are you making those decisions through? Uh, well, I, one of my problems early on in business was time. I didn't have enough time, so I read everything I could on time management, and I actually ended up writing a book on time management. Um, and one of the time management techniques I do is log my day every I do not do this all the time. I do it every once every six weeks. Every 15 minutes cycle, what was I doing? Oh, meeting with you, doing an interview. What was I doing the next? And then I have a column which is like or dislike. The things I like doing, I tend to be good at, and I probably shouldn't give them up. Right. And the things that I dislike doing, my guess is someone else probably likes doing it. And so I'm not saying I give up the, the craft jobs, but I give up the jobs that are not good to me. An example for me is... I don't particularly like accounting. I can actually go back there to my accounting department and say, I want you to spend four hours on this spreadsheet. They're going to say, wow, I can't believe it. I get to spend four hours on this spreadsheet. And I'm saying, oh my God, I can pull my hair out if I have to spend four hours on this spreadsheet. Yeah, that's cool. And then when you've done that process and distilled down what you like doing, uh, I mean, Danby, what level of, what size of company is Danby at? Like we're about 400 million in sales. Right, so you're not quite the two billion. No, no, not yet. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, actually, that's an interesting thing. Then, going from that two billion dollar, you know, infrastructure and business structure to the four hundred million business structure, are you doing more now, or are you still doing the things that you were doing less of? Like, so because I've learned over time what I like doing, I tend to be better at it than when I was early in business. Sure. Okay. So I tend to do more of what I like doing. But yes, the, the smaller the company, the more you end up doing. So my problem was I quit the $2 billion company and I became an angel capital, venture capital. I ran a little incubator, you know, I had 40 or 50 people. But the problem with that is then I all of a sudden didn't have everybody do the job. And when I don't have everybody do the job, um, I ended up having to do a lot of stuff and realized I didn't really like it as much as when I had a company that did. And that's why when Dan became up, I, I jumped at it. Because you can go kind of get back to oh, your happy place. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's cool. What, what I'm good at. Um, so you, you mentioned this idea uh, last time when you were doing a talk for our EO chapter uh, about the rule of 50. Yes. Uh, can you break that down a little bit? Oh, sure. I mean, there's a rule of 50 with employees. When you have 50 employees, you have to start managing differently. And the way 50 comes up is one person can influence seven people who influence seven people. So seven times seven is 49. Now, the way you extend it, make it so it's the rule of 60 for you, is longevity of staff. And if you have Herculean work ethic, right. so you can do it if you just happen to say, no problem, I'm just going to extend that my work day to 12 hour. But you can only get to 60, you can only get to 70, you, you may be able to do 100, but your style has to change when you get to 50. There's another rule of 200, when you hit 200, that's the maximum number of social relationships that one person can have. That means when you have more than 200 employees, I recommend having business units, which are 200. So um, in my previous company, I had like a seven story building. So you have 200 people per floor. A floor becomes more of a social unit, or you can have a warehousing unit, which is sort of a separate uh, unit. And the, the rule of 200, it happens whether or not you want it to happen. <laughs> right. it, it well, it's happens. a rule. It's a rule. Yeah. But now, where, where it does, but you can extend it a little bit, 
by longevity of staff and by high social relationships. So if you were to have a, you know, lunch together every day and everyone would have been with your company for 10 years, then it, you can maybe go to 220 or whatever. But sure, you know, but you're really diminishing your return. Right. Um, but rule of 50 and rule of 200, they're just slightly different accentuations of the same thing. As a leader, you have to change your style to over communicate and, uh, it, it, it over communicating often means feeling repetitive. Right? Yeah. And I, it feels weird for me to say, I told you that, Rob. Oh, I'm going to tell you again, right? Yeah. And so I just told you this. Oh, I better send you an email to tell you the same thing. Right. Um, and uh, in the style of getting rid of things, also, you have to not micromanage. You have to let people do their job. And the interesting thing is, you actually get a lot more from your people if you let them do their job. Yeah. And, and think of it as letting people do their job. Because if you don't let people do their job, you're going to go in and you don't like the paint color. Next thing you know, you're going to be picking the paint color. And you're like, Are you an interior decorator? Why should you pick the paint color? Like, I love that example. I, I think when you framed it the first time, you said, you know, if somebody paints the office and you come in and you say you don't like it, you've just made yourself the paint selector for life. Exactly. And then if I say, oh, by the way, there's paint, there's drips over here, then I'll be the painter. Right? <laughs> I'm one step further. Right? right. So the idea of like even just picking what hills you want to die on and then repeating and repeating and repeating. Exactly. Combined with the fact that the more successful you are in business, the more we think that we're smart. And when you think that you're smart, I should be the smart guy picking the paint color. But the fact of the matter is, I'm not an interior decorator. Right. Someone else can actually do a much better job at making it work than me. Right. But I, it, that's not the way we are in business. And it, it's, it's not even not the way we are in life. Like, you know how many times you go to an EO event and you'll have a great sports figure being the speaker. Okay, so great, you're a great hockey player. Why would you be good in business? Like, right. you're a great hockey player. I get it. Yeah, you've done a great job, and you should be able, like acknowledged for that. Exactly. And then how does it come over and translate? Exactly. And 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 I guess knowing your area of strength, something that someone mentioned to me, the idea is like once you understand like your superpower, the thing that you're best at, that if you were to do the most of, would provide you the most leverage and potential inside your organization. Um, it sounds it's similar to that idea of like do I like this and I'm typically good at things I like doing. Right. That's exactly right. And so for you, that idea of the superpower, um, did you ever kind of like identify that within yourself saying, you know, this, this is the thing that I see more clearly than most people. I, I love doing it. Absolutely. The more I know myself, the better I can do it. And many people work on their weaknesses. You want to work on your weakness only to the extent that it doesn't become a big gotcha. Right. But if I spent my whole life working on my weaknesses, I would die with a lot of strong weaknesses right if i'd sit, spend my time on what is my unique advantage and and polish that and get even better at it i can have such a killer advantage that yeah. uh is very difficult for anybody else to compete with that killer advantage that i might have and so what, what is it for you uh it's actually creativity but not in the way you think okay. it's business creativity so it's thinking of business uh creative and that sounds too simple, but I'll tell you, it's it's not simple. Like uh, it's. Well, I love I loved your your question about like what if you were to ask yourself how would you double your sales? Like, right. How do you double your sales today? Right. And, well, and, and the beauty of that is if I ask myself how do I increase my sales by eight percent, then I'm gonna think oh I'll I'll just work a little harder. I'll I'll work my lunch hours. I'll come in five minutes earlier. I'll I I you know, I can squeeze eight percent. Uh, right. Right. So and and that ask yourself to double or triple you can't double like you can't work double the time right. and if you can't work double the time then i'd say your goal has to be triple or quadruple like how do you do that that means you're gonna have to do things differently you can't keep doing it the way you do it yeah that's cool and that is that an example of what you mean in terms of business creativity so like thinking that way that that would be partly it but uh, business creativity the, the biggest example i would have recently is DMB makes appliances. We make about 2 million appliances a year, bar fridges, freezers, wine coolers, that sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. I got a couple. Perfect. And so uh, we, I came into the business and I'm sitting in the factory looking and saying, what else could we make in this factory? Because we came up with a bigger freezer. It's just another big, it's a white box of freezing. It's, it's like, well, we can do better designs, but at the end of the day, you're kind of in a market that's fixed. And then, of course, I have uh, Amazon parcels coming to my, and then I see online all of shipping and parcel delivery going through the roof and oh look there's a parcel theft so i changed and said 
no, we're not an appliance company. We're a company that makes big boxes. So we designed a product called Parcel Guard, which is basically a parcel mailbox that sits on your front porch. You get emailed or text to say you've got the parcel at 10 o'clock in the morning. You can look at the IP camera and see who delivers it. Yeah. But mostly, it protects your parcel so that someone can't just grab it off your front porch. Right. And, uh, and that is using business creativity, and it applies competitive advantage because we're used to moving big boxes. So we, and building them. And, and building them. Yeah, so we sell like 10 million or 10,000 containers um, of product a year. So for us to sell another uh, thousand containers or something, it's easy for us. For you, yeah, I'm telling you, you don't have, uh, you don't have enough space in your no, agency no, to, no. to move 10,000 uh, containers. No, no infrastructure, no supply yeah, chain uh, whatsoever. Uh, right, and, and it also happens to sell through our customers. So we sell to Costco and Home Depot and Lowe's and um, you know all those companies, Amazon, and it's that's a product that you would go buy on Amazon, just like you'd go buy it at Home Depot. So it, it fits our sales channel, fits our competitive advantage of moving big boxes, but it's creative in the most appliance companies. So I'm not competing on that product with Whirlpool or Frigidaire or GE or LG. Right, right, they're, they're, right. They, are, they're, they won't come up with that for years because they're sitting there saying, we're an appliance company. If it doesn't have a compressor and we don't make it. Right. And of course, we're sitting there happily making it and uh, staying cool. under the radar. And, yeah. There's a really little book called Marketing Myopia, and it was done by the Harvard Business, or yeah, it was done Harvard Business School Review, whatever. Anyway, it's like uh, maybe 45 pages long, and it's the size of a postcard, and it's all about understanding the real business you're in. Yeah, and it does all these case studies of like uh, Kodak thought they were in the film business, but they're in the memory business. And, right. Uh, projectors thought that they were in the projector business, but they were in the information display business. They thought trains were in the train business, but they were in the transportation business. And, because of all these companies or these businesses not realizing what business they're actually in, when change happened, they weren't able to see it. And so I love that idea of that we're, we're in the business of building boxes. Well, and you are a marketing agency. You, you think we're a marketing agency? No, what, you, what, are you, what are you really selling? You're selling increased sales. Yeah. You're in the sales increasing business. Yeah. If you're not in the sales increasing business, and that would open you up to say, oh, here's, now we're gonna do some sales training. What the hell is that in a marketing agency? Did you or, listen to the meeting we had this morning? Uh, I didn't listen to, listen to that. But like, are you, that is uncanny. Jim. But but that is how you can <laughs> add outsized value, and you can get a client, keep a client, because you say, "Oh, great, I'm gonna do great artwork for you guys." Okay, great artwork. No, no, I don't want great artwork. I want. And remember, I don't even want marketing awards. Like some agencies. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're great. They got the Golden Globe Award. Big deal. You get this this award. Did you sell more product? Yeah. If you sold more product, then you're successful. Yeah, that's cool. It's so interesting you say that. So we had a, a client say that they got, they're getting bad leads from us because they, someone would call it and be like, hey, do you sell oak leaks? And they would say no. And then they'd hang up, like the person would hang, okay, fine, they hang up the phone. And so like the training opportunity to help them understand how to right. have a conversation with that person is just right. like so, remarkably oh, evident. Oh, you're interested in oak leaks. Well, then you should look at these. Or like, why are you looking at oak leaks? Like what made you, whatever. There's so many things that could happen in that setting. So anyway, just, I, Literally for like two hours prior, prior to coming to this, we had this meeting around how we're going to start making that happen. So I just, I don't know, I feel like you're listening somewhere, uh, but still very cool. So, okay, switching switching subjects then. Um, you, you also met the idea, uh, you, you mentioned the idea around coaching culture, which I thought was really cool. And, and it kind of segues in from what you said before about, you know, doing less and becoming potentially repetitive. Um, with Danby, I love it because like when you, I, I drove in your parking lot, it says, Danby, do the right thing. Well, that could apply anywhere to anything, but at Dan B, it's over your front door in massive letters. So, what's this whole idea around coaching culture, over communicating, and, and, and that idea? So, I believe the bigger the business, the more the leader's job is to coach on culture and let everyone else make decisions. And it would be great if we had a manual that told you how to deal with every eventuality, but do the right thing is actually an easy employee manual. So, how do you treat your coworkers? Do the right thing. How do you treat your customers? Do the right thing. How do you treat your suppliers? Do the right thing. Do you ship product doesn't work? No, do the right thing. So that is that was how it started with me. Is just uh, because we couldn't possibly have a manual to say what happens when this happens. Right. You can't have it. Um, I also heard this idea too that if you if you make it so that your organization can be run by dummies, you'll have an organization full of dummies. Ah, oh, right. Yes. 
I mean, there's a great book on that, Emeth, which talks about basically Gerber, right? Gerber. Yeah, 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 Michael Gerber, Emeth. And it is a great book, and everyone should read it, but you do have to be careful because his idea is you can hire a bunch of dummies, and you are the genius, and you're the one that knows how to do it. You know where most of our genius little ideas come from? Not from me. It comes from the guy who's shipping product who says, you know, every time I have to ship a product, I have to go get my tape gun from over here, and if we had a tape gun over here, then it'd be and save myself five minutes a day, or I have no idea, right? I love that. Well, they're right there. They're closest to the problem. Uh, they they know it, and I don't know it. I just said, oh, we, we should be able to do that. And then they point out, yeah, but we only have 10 docs here, you know? So then how do you, or what have you done? So with the Do the Right Thing, how did that come to be? Like, what what inspired so, that, tra- that change? Well, it did, Do the Right Thing was mostly just how do you scale the business, because we can't have a business manual that explains everything. And then part of the principle, I'd like to have a company, I, company, I call it a we support a culture of failure, which sounds odd. No, I well, it might sound odd, but I fully love that. It's basically idea. fail often, fail fast, fail cheap, and having a failure does not make us a failure, and what makes us a failure is that we don't try. So you want to try a lot of things, and if what works, works, and uh, and you never get questioned in my company, I hope, if you do the right thing. Now, what would be the wrong thing is to go out and say, oh, we just spent $100,000 on this reception desk. like. Did you did you get three quotes and did we really need a hundred thousand dollar reception desk or you know whatever? So it, it it does translate to everything from financial through to business. Um, I mean, it even goes to you know do we take this piece of business? I don't maybe I don't want to sell someone a uh, hundred freezers at that price because we're going to lose money. I mean that's a simple example. Right? Sure. Uh, remember, your in your agency that is absolutely critical for you to pick the right customer. If you pick the wrong customer, you're going to have an unhappy customer and your expectation is wrong and nothing's good about having a customer that's the wrong customer for you. Well, and like, we can't win. I mean, if you go back to what you were saying before about getting the increased sales, if, you know, if we're not doing that for somebody, they're not going to be happy. And at the end of the day, we know who we can do it for. Exactly. Um, and so we have a lot of people knocking on our door and so hopefully we can do our best to provide resources for them if we can't help them uh, actually. But you're right, it does cause a lot more grief. And then you have all this attention and burn rate in your clients, and that's no fun at all. So speaking of burn rate, you mentioned this idea of live with no burn rate. What did that mean? Oh, well, that's a sort of personal advice for uh, the entrepreneurs or the people. Uh, I have found that when entrepreneurs or people have too much personal expenses, then they have a lot of stress in their life, and there's certain things they can't do, and there's certain people who can put them out of business because you need to be making... uh, way more money than me or whatever and so that, that's just me I, I believe in not having much personal burn rate yeah I love that idea I think a lot of people need to hear it um, from the from the talk that you did um, I mean I'm, I'm pretty good from a financial management perspective in my own personal life but like I was like you know what I'm gonna go just look at this and I've got some apps that show me where I spend my money and that kind of stuff but I just downloaded my transactions from my credit cards and from my debit and just went through the whole thing did it with my wife's too and we did the whole thing I was like, oh, that's, this is remarkably surprising, right? And so I found all sorts of areas to reduce the burn rate. And it was just really meaningful for me because then I had that open conversation uh, in our family. And then it's, it's actually made impact. So maybe you could just break it down a quick a little bit for everybody. So maybe it might impact them in a similar way. Well, see, I think part of the reason that I'm such a frugal guy is when I started a business, I had no money. And when you have no money, you have to live on having no money. Yeah. And, and then what I've learned in business, it has served me well. By serving me well, because I'm in a competitive situation, I end up with lower costs, and it translates my personal life into my business life, and it just works well. And the other part of it is stress in life. Like a lot of what you need in life is to be not overstressed. And I'm telling you, it's kind of overstressed if you have your car payments coming up on Friday and you don't have your money in the bank. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and I mean, even more so, I think in, in terms of people with like a payroll that they might not totally. be able to make and then stress goes crazy and then they don't want to share with anybody and all that kind of stuff. And so in that, I call it growth within profitability. So uh, I will have my branch manager in Halifax says, oh, I want to hire another salesperson. Oh, no problem. If you want to hire another salesperson, you need to increase sales by $2 million a month and, or whatever the number is and uh, and do that for, you know, if you can do that for five months, well, then you probably afford to hire another salesperson. They always say, oh, no, I, we want to buy and then sell. No. I think of the sell and then buy. And even uh, development businesses often have that problem. To say, oh, I'm going to develop this product, then the market's going to buy it. I say, go sell it to someone and then who says they're going to pay $100,000, then spend your money to develop it. That's cool. Sell, then buy. I like that a lot. 
and this idea of leading with revenue because if somebody's willing to put their money on the table then, and with commitment then huge, you, then you huge difference that between hypothesis. right I, I can't I've learned the hard way because I did some market research and said would you buy this product for thousand dollars and you get oh, of course say, of course and then you oh here's the product for thousand dollars oh I wouldn't pay thousand dollars I want five hundred oh I didn't really mean I was gonna buy it oh you mean I have to put my visa on the line oh I didn't know that, that yeah, yeah 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 it's, it's a big difference it's free well why don't you just let me use that for free and Oh, wow. Yeah. When you put money on the line, it actually makes the commitment. Uh, and which is something I, I learned from someone else. Uh, the idea is if someone buys in, they buy it. <laughs> so they put their money in, they're actually bought in. Absolutely. It's an interesting concept. Uh, adversity quotient. I love that. Yes. This is something that you mentioned I thought was really, really interesting. Um, I think there's a big, uh, I'm not sure if it's a lack of perspective or something like that, but I'm a big believer in the idea that struggle builds resilience. Yes. Um, and now, have you ever met Warren Rustand? Don't believe so. Uh, I may have, though. Really, really cool guy. Uh, he was just in Halifax at the EO conference. Um, and he's from uh, down south in the States. But anyway, he, he was he was talking about this idea that, like, uh, as a lot of people that are entrepreneurs that came from nothing and then built wealth don't want their kids to go through the same struggles that they went through. And, and he said very adamantly to the group, he said, don't you do that to your children. Don't you take away the struggle to help build their strength. I, I agree completely. Unfortunately, because I'm in YPO on the same issue that I've seen YPOers have essentially spoiled their kids, and uh, it's uh, it doesn't make them strong, good business leaders. The difference between EO and YPO is YPO you can also have hired guns and you can have inherited businesses. Right, right. So someone and so there's people who have inherited their business and they know they're fine wine, but they don't know how to struggle and get things done. They say, well, I am very frugal. I only stayed in a four-star hotel instead of a five-star. You know, <laughs> little <difference. laughs> yeah. Exactly. Are you kidding? I didn't even fly business class on that one-hour flight. <laughs> yeah, tough, tough go. <laughs> exactly. So then what's what's it like then? What do you think in terms of giving people opportunities from? So uh, I there's a great book, Adversity Quotient, but the gist of it is you've got EQ, which is your intelligence. You've got, uh, or sorry, IQ, you which is your intelligence, EQ is your emotional intelligence, and that's the, you know, not losing control and emotional control, and at one time I said that's what causes success more than IQ, because you've got genius people who can't communicate, and AQ is another Q, which is, if you struggle through adversity, you're likely to be a stronger person, you're likely to do better, so I'm just a big believer in uh, that AQ and people who overcome adversity, even in one area, are likely to overcome it in another area. Yeah, so so this, this gentleman, Warren, uh, he told his children when they were eight that they weren't going to receive any inheritance and that he wasn't going to lend them a dime. And, <laughs> I mean, some people might think it's a bold or crass maneuver, um, uh, but they all ended up, you know, getting really involved with their schools and, and taking on really, you well, know, and, great and, careers. But I told my, my kids uh, if they want a business when they grow up, they can start their own. Right. My business, my, my kids don't work in my business. It's, they want a business, they can start their own. Yeah. Why not? I just think it's it's uh, overlooked a lot. And I, I think it's really the idea. And the adversity quotient, this is the idea of like learning about that. I think making people aware about the struggle is okay. Is right. Probably a good idea. Well, and the other lesson in entrepreneurship, because I'm old and I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs and seen a lot of entrepreneurs, we actually remember the fond times of sleeping in our car before the trade show. And like of, of the tough times, those are fonder memories than the t- times that weren't that tough. Yeah, like the novelty of sleeping in your car uh, kind of is uh, a memory. It's a memory, right. So I can say, you know, this is cool. I slept in my car, but it's, you know, isn't it great. I slept in the Holiday Inn. Well, that's not very exciting. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So uh, Shipper B, yeah. what's, what's the deal? Oh, so, so Shipper B will be my environmental legacy. So what we're doing is we're starting a parcel delivery company that reduces carbon emissions by 77% per parcel. 77% is huge. I, like, I got into to Shipper B with Parcel Guard. I studied the market, you know, 15 billion parcels a year ship, growing at 20% per year, so it's 3 billion more parcels per year ship. Right. There's not enough capacity because you can't hire truck drivers. And uh, and then I looked and said, well, oh, that's that's a huge environmental impact. How can Massive. we do that? And that one I would not even do if it wasn't the environmental thing because I kind of like my Dan B. Gates kind of the nice, easy, right size. You know, it's not a big company. It's a smallish, mid-sized company that I can sort of, I can sort of just relax and run. But Shipper B will be my environmental legacy. And I actually believe in climate change. I believe it's our biggest challenge is this climate. And 
I read a book called Uninhabitable Earth, mm -hmm. and there's two ways you can do it. One is be scared and go hide under a pillow because you're nervous and think the you know, sky, or the other way to take it is, okay, that makes me mad. What can I do to help? And I believe, I know I can reduce the carbon per parcel by 77%. That's and huge. That's huge. And, uh, and can I do that for 1% of the parcels, 2%, 5%? I mean, and, and if I change it, and even to the world to do that, even if I'm not the one that does it, then I will have made a meaningful impact. That's cool, man. Yeah. So what was the inspiration be behind the name Shipper B? Oh, the, the problem you know is finding a name is almost impossible. So we're a parcel delivery company, so you're brainstorming all the names, and Shipper B is just a really cool name, and it's really easy from a marketing perspective. You know, like, sure. Do you get our newsletter? It's the buzz, you know, and, uh, right. you know, it's and, 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 yeah, exactly. But, but you're the hive master. You're the, uh, and, you know. but, and, but isn't that kind of part of the model though? It's like this hive approach. Oh yeah. That, that's to parcel delivery. Uh, y yes, exactly. So what we're doing is we're, um, instead of doing hub and spoke, right. um, where if I ship actually to you, it would go from here to Mississauga to, to which is your office. Right. So you don't, you avoid the backpack. Instead it goes from here to the Petrocana station, the SO station to your office. That appears probably only one stop, but you, sure. you, you get the gist of it um, from here to Cambridge. So it just hops from this hive to hive to hive. So you replace the, the um, hub, the hubs, the distribution, the distribution hubs with small, it's like the internet, small, small nodes, like, um, it's like the internet. Like yeah, and, 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 it, and it's like a neural network. It's a totally neural network, and, and it has the advantages of neural network. So, oh, the 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 hub at uh, Petro Canada is down. Okay, no big deal. You're going to the SO station, right? Yeah. And, and so everything can uh, bypass. Uh, we solve the sort issue because when you go into a sort center, you've got a million parcels. It's like if I give you ten decks of cards to sort, and I've got one deck of cards. You're not ten times as long. You're twenty times as long. So yeah. I, like, it, and so the speed difference. Uh, are you going into a hive? There's only. Uh, six parcels in a compartment you know like it's it's yeah. not not it's cool it's, I've, I've, have you read the book teaming no it's all about lessons from super beans okay so it's all like these crazy natural phenomenons of of organisms yeah from like crazy types of ants to and bees are part of it yeah anyway there's i think there's 12 or something like that um and it's just the lessons learned from these beans uh, and how we can apply it to humans through business through environmental impact through social change through whatever um, and I, I was just, after being exposed to this, I, I, I just thought maybe that was part of the inspiration because it's very much aligned with that whole idea, which is super cool. And the, the other idea, which is really neat, is, uh, so the idea of the traditional organizational structure is kind of uh, laid out like a head with shoulders, right, and hands and fingers, and it, and it mimics the idea of the body being the, the, the driving thing, so the back, the labor, the, the actual force. And then the organizational structure mimics it. And then there's this idea now of changing organizational structures to mimic more around the brain and having these neural networks because a lot of the value of the brain the economy now is brain value, not just muscle value. Um, and so I just thought it was really neat too because we talk about the idea of social connections and having these divisions instead of having this crazy hierarchy uh, start organizing people in smaller groups. And, and then the idea from that came that the most effective group size is about 4.6 people or 5 people as opposed to these like, large departments of like, you know, 25 or 40 people. Well, and the problem you get in hierarchy is we naturally think the person at the head of the hierarchy is smarter or knows more. But the nature of a proper hierarchy, is, I don't know half as much as the person working on the line. Yeah, not even about, you, about the line. I can't you? know anything about it. Right. Yeah. And so you have to get that out of your head. A hierarchy can't be that. So that's where I, I jump to with servant leadership. My whole thing is how can I help you do your job? And, get things and, anyway. and, and many times it's things to help do the job. They think it's a big deal. And it's like, this is a nothing. Like, <laughs> like well, you know, if we had a roller belt that would uh, do this, you know, that would just be awesome. And I'm looking at it, so let me get this straight. You're doing this 20 times a day and it's going to save you an hour a day and it's going to cost me $200. Like, it's done. <laughs> exactly. But they think it's a big deal because I have to go install a new roller or whatever, right? That's cool. Yeah. So... If you had to go back and tell yourself when you're in your trunk of your car something that you wish you knew now that you wish you had known then, or something that you do know now that you wish you had known then, what would it be? Um, I'm going to say don't sweat the little things and go more with the flow because we tend to fight everything, including nature. So we need to have everything perfectly weeded and manicured. The fact is it's pretty good as 
as it is. Right. And uh, so I would often try to fight everything, and I don't need to fight everything. I can let things happen, so be more zen. And I, over time, I've learned to be more zen. Cool. Well, thanks for doing this, Jim. Okay, really appreciate Thank you. it. Okay, okay, see you guys.